starting off at number 10, we have The Stand by Stephen King. This book is probably one of those books you should put off reading until after the pandemic is over, whenever that is. We all know Stephen King is quite literally the king of horror, but this novel will hit home way too hard and fill you with ideas of what could have been. The Stand is about an apocalyptic world that fell to a deadly flu-like virus intended to be used as a biological weapon. Already this sounds a bit familiar, but it gets worse. In this book, King introduces one of his most famous villains, Randall Hall. Once the outbreak takes hold, people start having visions of a benevolent woman and a terrifying dark man who is, of course, plotting to destroy the world. I'll stop now before I add any spoilers. Bear in mind, this book is a commitment. There are two versions, the 400 page one Stephen's publisher forced him to publish, or the 1200 page unabridged version. Either way, get comfy and leave the light on because once you start, you won't be able to put this book down. Also, they made a TV show about it, so check that out too. But after you read the book. In our number nine spot today, we have The Collector. The Collector is a book that was written in 1963 by John Fowles and is a pretty wild thriller. This book is written from two separate perspectives and is about an absolute psycho who kidnaps a young woman who is an art student. He keeps her locked up in the cellar of his farmhouse and part of the novel is from the point of view of the captor and the other half is told from the perspective of the woman he has kidnapped. The beginning of the novel is from his point of view and it details his obsession with the woman and why he has formed this horrible plan. The part from her point of view is detailed through diary entries that she's made rather than regular narration. The whole book is an absolute roller coaster and is extremely interesting. Of course, both characters have quite a few developments over the course of the story, and sometimes things can get extremely dark, but the ending is one that none of us really ever saw coming. Coming in at number eight, we have The Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. Dude, I'm not claustrophobic, and obviously there are tons of Edgar Allan Poe short stories books we could have used, but damn. We couldn't make this list without featuring him at least once, and this story felt right. Warning, some spoilers ahead, but also, this was written in like 1846, you've had time. The Cask of Amontillado is a story of revenge. Montresor was deeply insulted by his rival, Fortunato, and uses his fondness for Sherry to exact his revenge. But the way he does it, and the way the story builds around it is so skillful. It's so horrible you want to look away, but you can't. Montresor planned everything everything to a T, even making Fortunato bait himself into his own trap. Fortunato ends up watching Montresor build a wall of thick stone, trapping him inside a deep cellar forever. I think that's what gets me about this story is that he's he's watching his own demise and he can't do anything about it. It terrifies me. Oh man, so maybe I am claustrophobic. Maybe. So anyway, check that one out. Coming in at number seven, we have the Voynich Manuscript. Who knows what is happening and what is contained within the text of the Voynich Manuscript? The text is regularly alluded to as the world's most mysterious book. Written in the early 15th century, what the 240 page cryptic text actually says is still a mystery and it has baffled humans for 600 years. It appears to be written in an unknown language and contains strange illustrations and diagrams. The book has been passed down from emperors and important members of society, eventually falling into the hands of a Polish book dealer. A 2006 book by Nicholas Pelling claims that the text is cursed. Others think that it was secretly dropped on earth by aliens. There are hopes that Canadian computer scientists may have invented a machine that will be able to decode the enigmatic text. Who knows what we'll discover? Almost as intriguing as what the text said is who or what wrote it. We still don't know. Coming into number six, we have the Codex Gygas. The Codex is a hefty old chap weighing 165 pounds, so more than me. The text heralds from the 12th century and is referred to as the Devil's Bible. Why? Well, according to the legends, the monk who wrote the text had broken his vow and was due to be walled to death. So what actually happens when somebody's walled to death? Well, it's a bit like being buried alive, but instead you're bricked up in a wall, like in a really, really small space until you run out of air and die in the wall. Really not ideal. In fact, I feel like it happens in an episode of Jonathan Creek, so if anyone watches that, 
Shout out to you. Anyway, the night before his death, he wanted to create a book on all human knowledge, but he realized that, you know what, that's actually not a long time to write a book. He summoned Lucifer and asked him to finish it for him in exchange for his already damned soul. Apparently, this is why there's a picture of the devil in the manuscript. But it's not just any picture, it's a 19 inch tall picture. So, a text written by the devil, surely no good can come from reading it. Coming into number five, we have the Book of Soiger. The Book of Soiger is an early 16th century treatise on demonology written in Latin. There are only two copies of the book in the world, and one was possessed by Elizabethan scholar John Dee, who spent his life trying to interpret the text. Basically, the text is filled with spells and rituals, and it's kind of creepy. He had a pretty good grasp of what was happening, except for the final 36 pages, which he simply couldn't decipher. He and his trusted friend Edward Kelly summoned the spirit Uriel to tell them the meaning of the last pages. Now, the legend says that Uriel possessed Kelly and spoke through him. He claimed that the book came into existence when Adam entered paradise and that it could only be properly interpreted by Archangel Michael himself. He also said that whoever does decipher the meaning of the final 36 pages will be destined to die two and a half years after they do so. Coming into number four, we have the prophecies of Nostradamus. Did Nostradamus curse us or were his texts a warning? The 16th century French physician wrote a collection of 942 poetic prophecies, many of which have come true. A lot of people think that these quatrains were, like his grave, cursed. If he had the power to curse his grave, why wouldn't his poetry be cursed? Nostradamus famously prophesied the Great Fire of London, the death of King Henry II, the French Revolution, vaccination, the rise of Hitler, the atomic bombs, 9 11, and more. We just don't know what they are yet. Reading these texts may not curse you, but then again, knowledge of a terrible event without the ability to change the outcome must be a great curse indeed. Coming into number three, we have The Great Omar. The Francis Sangorski special edition of The Great Omar is for sure cursed. Not only was the original one of the most blinging books around, it seemed to be on the receiving end of some seriously bad juju. Emblazoned with gold leaf, gemstones, and peacock feathers, the original copy of The Great Omar sank on board the Titanic and is lost somewhere in the North Atlantic Ocean. Sangorski then died just six weeks later as he drowned in an accident in the English Channel. A second copy was made by Stanley Bray, recreating the original. Now that copy was destroyed in the London Blitz. A third copy was then painstakingly recreated by Bray once again, who died just five years later. When asked about the book's tragic history, Bray said, I'm not in the least bit superstitious, even though they do say that the peacock is a symbol of disaster. I'll say. Now the only surviving copy now lays in the British Library. Visit, if you dare. This isn't a book up next, but it is a poem which really is just kind of a short lyrical book. Now, I'm not sure you're ready for this, but people who read this poem are doomed to die. In at number two, we have Tomino's Hell. I know that all men must die and all of that, but Tomino's Hell is said to speed the process way up. The poem is a 1919 Japanese work of literature that is cursed, 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 and cursed again. It's supposed to cause death and tragedy if you read it aloud, so just don't do it. The poem tells the story of a young boy's damnation, his sickness as he vomits its blood and travels to the blackest of hells. Lovely jubbly. It isn't just Japanese readers who need to be a bit worried. The poem has been translated into English. Now, reading the poem is fine, feel free, even though it is kind of gross. What you don't want to do, though, is read it aloud in any language, unless, you know, well, just actually don't do it. Finally, at number one, we have one of the most cursed and spooky books in the entire history of print. We have The Grand Grimoire. The Grand Grimoire is often referred to as the Gospel of Satan or the Red Dragon Text. And it is a book of spells believed to possess insane powers, but beyond that, it's said to be one of the most intense and potent occult books in existence. Written in the 16th century, the incantation book tells the reader how to summon the dead, and also how to summon powerful demons. Deeper sections of the book allegedly tell the reader how to do a deal with the devil. The book was said to be written by a man who was possessed by Satan. Now, the original text is so dangerous that it is allegedly held in storage by the Vatican's secret archives. The book is so mysterious and famous that it is frequently referenced in pop culture. Starting off this countdown, we have The Sorrows of Young Werther. This book has been famously associated with something referred to as the Werther effect because of the negative impact it had on readers. So this book came out in 1774 and it inspired a huge wave of people taking their lives. It was a terrible epidemic. That's how strong the influence had on its readers. 
So young men started to copy the main character in the book. They would dress the same as he was portrayed in the book and then later would take their own lives the way that he did in the book. This caused the book to be banned in countries such as Denmark and Italy. It was so bad that people believed this book was cursed and every young man that read it will soon be tempted to take their own life, even if they were in the right mindset. In our number nine spot today, we have The Orphan's Story. This book was originally written in the early 1600s, but it didn't end up getting published until 2018. The Orphan's Story is about a 14 year old Spanish boy who heads to the Americas. You know, a classic coming of age feel good story, right? Well, not exactly, and that is the reason it took so long for it to be published. While the curse in this book doesn't come from the story itself, there is something dark lurking in those pages. The book's publisher, Belinda Palacios, who worked on the book for two years, explained that throughout those years, she was often warned of the cursed book and how every publisher who had tried to work on it before ended up passing away in a mysterious way before they were able to finish the book. When Belinda looked into this, it turned out to be true. Her research showed that those who tried tried to edit the book before either found themselves in horrible accidents or with strange illnesses. Luckily Belinda made it through the process unscathed, so let's hope that maybe the curse has been lifted? Either way, it's probably one I'll personally stay away from. Moving on at number 8 we have The Lesser Key of Solomon. The Lesser Key of Solomon is a cursed grimoire that is said to contain summoning spells for over 72 demons, and no one knows who wrote it. What we do know though is that this book contains a bunch of compiled texts from the 17th century. Some of these texts tell the reader how to conjure and control spirits or demons. This book is apparently so cursed that anyone who keeps a copy of it will die or experience constant bad luck. One person who owned a copy of the book reported the book's pages turning on its own. Another time, the book violently flew across the room and towards them. Although we don't know who wrote the book, legend has it that King Solomon originally wrote it for his son. He then asked him to be buried with it. But apparently, when he was getting prepared for burial, a group of Babylonian philosophers found the book, and one of them got a vision from an angel. The angel told him to hide the book from the unworthy, so he decided to cast a spell on it to keep it from getting into the wrong hands. And that's how the book got cursed. In our number 7 spot today, we have Tender is the Flesh. Tender is the Flesh is a dystopian novel that was originally written in Spanish by Augustina Basterica. This novel is based in a world where a terrible virus has wiped out all animals except for humans. Instead of living a vegan lifestyle, humans have adapted in a way where cannibalism is now legal. This novel describes the process of breeding and slaughtering humans just for the means of consumption. Humans who are bred for food have their vocal cords removed in order to make them easier to control and because of the fact that meat meant for human consumption should certainly not be able to speak. The main character of this story is a man named Marcos and he is a human meat supplier who is a little unsure about these new societal rules, but we also delve into his personal life and the things he has gone through previous to this point. Marcos is divorced and everything changes when he is given one of the female humans who is meant to help with the production of the human meat. This story is absolutely insane, and while the entire premise is quite dark, the twist this book has is truly unbelievable. So coming in at number 6 we have 1984 by George Orwell. I mean, duh, for putting this book on here, of course. It's terrifying. This is the most terrifying love story you will ever read, and you should. This book perfectly illustrates the bone-chilling possibilities that could happen if a government decided to take totalitarianism as far as it could go. It's been banned in the past for its social, sexual, political content, which is hilariously ironic because the whole book is about... Uh, what happens if censorship goes too far. From the horrors of erasing human beings through unpersoning, persecuting people for thought crimes, the creation of newspeak for abolishing love, all the way to the most gruesome kinds of torture, like ugh, think Game of Thrones. There are images I cannot erase from my mind. I remember knowing that Orwell wrote this as a commentary on Stalinism, but I didn't expect the love story. The two main characters endeavor to commit a small rebellion, which is to simply fall in love, because that's the only Thing that they can do to fight this massive establishment. The way Orwell finds ways of igniting the humanity in his readers in order to highlight the terror of the circumstances they're in, it's haunting. The scary element of this book isn't a killer clown or a monster with 18 eyes. 
Instead, it's absolute power. This book outlines the terror of power in a world that's gone too far and you won't be the same after you read it. In our number five spot today, we have A Girl is a Half-Formed Thing. A Girl is a Half-Formed Thing is a stream of consciousness novel that was written by Emer McBride. This novel tells the story of a girl growing up in a traditional Irish family and all the struggles that she faces. At a first glance, this might not seem like a horrible thing that should be feared, but this novel goes deep. The writing style is absolutely fantastic and really highlights exactly what this character is going through. We never get a chance to know the name of the girl, but we get to know so much about her long-winded Catholic mother who is cruel, her disabled brother, and her very creepy uncle. Without giving much away, this really does set the scene for what's to come. This book can be hard to read because of the content, but it can also be hard to read because of the writing style. But as you go through, you understand why it is written this way, and it is genius. This book is intense, and while it took Emer nine years too long to publish it, that really is a testament to how perfect it is. Coming in at number four, we have The Invasion of the Body Snatchers by Jack Finney. Uh, I can't. This book, I don't want to sleep for weeks. For weeks. Imagine an alien invasion happens and you can't even see it. Before you know it, everyone you know and love is acting. Strangely, soon bodies start piling up all while more and more people become something you can't explain. Written in 1955, Invasion of the Body Snatchers by Jack Finney is so terrifying. It has sparked four movies and paranoid horror literature. The story recounts the horrific experience of a silent invasion where alien beings disguised as plants steal the bodies of living humans while they sleep. The most terrifying part for me was the struggle for the characters to try and stay awake because if they didn't, the creatures would be right behind them in like s what seemed like seconds. Even thinking about it right now makes my heart race. <laughs> Have you ever tried not falling asleep in math class or an exam? Yeah, imagine that, but your life depends on it. Terrifying. This is the kind of horror book that will make you want to drink like 28 Red Bulls so you never sleep again. In our number three spot today, we have Exquisite Corpse. Exquisite Corpse is a horror novel that was written by Poppy Z. Bright and was published in 1996. The publication for this book was quite a process for Poppy. In 1991, she had a deal with a publishing company to write three books. Exquisite Corpse was the final of the three and this company refused to publish it due to its violent content. After sending it to multiple other publishing companies, the overwhelming consensus was that the writing was fantastic, but the content was being described as too nihilistic, too extreme, and a bloodbath without justification. Of course, however, the novel did eventually end up being published, and a lot of people now understand the reviews the publishing companies were giving it. While a fantastically written book, this story follows Andrew Compton, who is a convicted serial killer and cannibal, who ends up getting a second chance at living life beyond the cell. This story is very raw and absolutely horrifying. The parts of the story I haven't told you are certainly not for the faint of heart. In our number one spot today, we have The Wasp Factory. The Wasp Factory is a novel that was published in 1984 and was written by Ian Banks. This is the first novel that was published from this writer, as the novels he had previously written had not been accepted, and this one was his attempt at writing a more mainstream novel. Well, it worked since it got published, but this novel is anything but mainstream. It follows a psychopathic teenager who is living on a secluded Scottish island. The teenager describes his childhood and the things that went on with some very gruesome details. We read not only about his past, but also the past of his family and how twisted it really is, which also gives us insight into just how wild this guy's mind really is. There are some pretty horrific depictions of violence in this book, which is what led to its mixed reviews. It certainly is a critically acclaimed novel, but it has also also been called a work of unparalleled depravity, and that certainly speaks volumes about what exactly goes on. In our number 10 spot, we have the Voynich Manuscript. There is a book that is said to be from the 15th century that was once purchased by an antique book dealer by the name of Wilfred Voynich in 1912. The book is quite odd as it is written in a sort of code that has many historians scratch their heads. No one has been able to crack the code of this book, but it is believed to be the holding place for medical instructions as there are illustrations of herbs, plants, astrology, people, animals, and maps. 
clearly a witch's book. Most recently, after many years of studying the book, a German Egyptologist by the name of Rainer Hanig believes that he figured out how to translate the book. He has said that the book is seemingly written in a Semitic language such as Hebrew or Arabic, and that it will still take a few years to translate it in its entirety as the peculiarity and vocabulary of the period will be cause for it taking some time. The book is currently in Yale University's Rare Book and Manuscript Library. Next up in our number 9 spot we have the Urantia book. This book is so mysterious that no one actually knows who wrote it. The book was said to have been written between the period of 1924 to 1955 and it was found in Chicago. The book talks about the meaning of life. God, Jesus, philosophy, and science. It apparently tells the story of Jesus as if he were a regular man, not the miracle worker he was betrayed as in the Bible. Urantia is Earth. The book came into the public's awareness because of doctors William and Lena Sadler, who were have said to have been given the book by their neighbor. Their neighbor claimed that her husband was channeling some otherworldly being. He started to write the messages down that he channeled and it eventually became this book. The identity of the man was never revealed as it was said that the authors being channeled never wanted any human name to be associated with the book. Interesting. Reminds me a little of Esther Hicks who channels the entities who she calls Abraham, but unlike her books, this one seems quite dark and possibly cursed. In our number 8 spot we have Les Prophecies. This is a very famous book that arguably is filled with ancient knowledge than curses, but there are supporters on both sides of these perspectives. Written by Michel de Nostradamus, the French alchemist, doctor, and claimed seer who could supposedly view future events before they happened. He wrote this book in the year 1555, predicting future events that have been said to have come true and events of the time while he was still alive. This is a highly acclaimed book that in recent times has become way more popular because of certain predictions coming true. He apparently predicted the assassination of the American president John F. Kennedy, the French Revolution, and some speculate that he predicted Hitler. A very famous part of the book depicts a young child growing growing up in the west of Europe from a poor family. His tongue will seduce a great troop and his fame will increase towards the realm of the east. Hitler was actually very popular in a city in Germany that was in the northeast. Berlin. He also managed to persuade many to join his cause and grew up from a poor family in the west of Europe. Seems like a perfect fit if you ask me. I have actually been fascinated by this book for many years and I wonder what prediction may come true next. In our number 7 spot today we have the untitled grimoires. A witch's spell book should never be messed with. I feel like that should be obvious but I'll put that out there because apparently it isn't. The untitled grimoires are a set of handwritten spell books that were sold online for $14,000 in 2013. The books were written in the 1960s by a high priestess of Wicca who was the leader of a coven and they detail things like spells, incantations, enchantments, and instructions on summoning spirits and demons. So witch stuff. This is all fine and well unless you're sitting there thinking about how you don't believe. If you are a non-believer it is best to stay as far away as possible from these books. The seller of the books warned that any non-believers who mess with the book will bring upon themselves a deadly curse and on the first page of the book the Wiccan herself wrote that proceeding with the book may have serious consequences. It reads, to those not of the craft the reading of this book is forbidden. Proceed no further or justice will exact a swift and terrible retribution distribution and you will surely suffer at the hands of the craft. I think we can all appreciate the heads up she gave us on this one. Again, this is just another one I'll probably stay far away from and not just because I don't have $14,000 to spend on a pair of books. Coming in at number 6 we have The Catcher in the Rye. This book has been linked to a number of murders. It's believed that the book might have inspired these killings. First we have John Lennon. When John Lennon was shot by Mark David Chapman, apparently he calmly sat down on the curb and started flipping through the catcher in the rye as he waited for the police. In fact, inside the book it was later discovered he wrote, and I quote, to Holden Caulfield from Holden Caulfield. This is my statement. And he signed it Holden's name, who is the main character of the book. Furthermore, when police arrested him he said, and I quote, I'm sure the big part of me is Holden. 
The small part of me must be the devil. And during his trial, he even read from the book when it was his turn to address the court. But he's not the only one that's been influenced by this book. After John Hinckley Jr.'s assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan, it was discovered he too was a fan of the book, and a copy was even found on the table in his hotel room. And lastly, let's talk about Robert John Bardo. He took the life of Rebecca Schaefer. Well, he had the book in his back pocket while he did the deed. The list goes on and on. There are a dozen more people that apparently got inspired by this book and went on to harm or take someone's life. So some people believe that this book is in fact cursed and will drive the same insane. In our number five spot today, we have the book of the sacred magic of Abramelin the mage. When you're a practitioner of magic, you probably don't give the same sort of gifts that non-magic folk do. So it is no surprise that Abram Mellon gifted his son a book of spells and curses. In the early 1900s, this book was translated into English, and ever since then, there have been rumors swirling that the book is cursed, which makes a ton of sense considering, like I mentioned, it is a book of curses. Rumor has it that the cursed nature of this book, in part, has to do with Abram Mellon's belief that everyone has their own personal demon. The book holds instructions on how to get your demons under control through rituals and supernatural situations, and it is always risky to reach out to the spirit world, so maybe that's why everyone is feeling like this book is cursed. It's looking like unless you absolutely know what you're doing, the contents of this book just might be too powerful. Those who have had bad experiences with the book explain either bad luck or hauntings from the spirit world are what await for those who dare to read it. Coming in at number four, we have the Devil's Bible. The Devil's Bible, otherwise known as the Codex Gigas, is this massive 310 page book said to harness evil and negative energy. It was discovered in 1648 and is 36 inches tall, 20 inches wide, 8.7 inches thick, and weighs 165 pounds. So now there's this really creepy legend surrounding it. Legend goes that the book was written by a monk, but this monk broke his spiritual vows and his his punishment was to be sealed behind a brick wall and left to die. The night before his death, he realized he wouldn't be able to finish this book. So he summoned Lucifer and asked him to complete it for him. In return, he offered him his soul. So legend goes that this book was finished by the devil himself. To make things creepier, this book is filled with drawings of the devil and other demonic entities. On one page, there's a 19-inch frightening drawing of Satan, and apparently the book also contains a bunch of dark rituals and facts like how to perform exorcisms. To top it all off, apparently at some point, the book contained 320 pages, not just 310. Those 10 pages were ripped out because they instructed people on how to summon the devil, and thank gosh for that. Number 8, The Book of Black Magic and Pacts. At first, I thought this said black magic and pets, and I got really excited for a hot moment. This book, written by A.E. Waits, is a guide on all things occult. It looks at lore, magic, occultist history, and of course, ceremonies. There's certainly no issue with all this in itself in a book, but when this book is in the wrong hands, things can get a little dicey, especially considering this book has been referred to as one of the greatest overviews of occultism, and it includes a large number of magical spells from a variety of sources. Yeah, they all have spells in them. They're all like Harry Potter. They're all like the Chamber of Secrets, that book that he stabs with a tooth. They're all like that, they're all bad. The author of this book, A.E. Wade, is said to have been a British scholarly mystic as well as a poet, and it's said that he was quite a prolific writer on both the occult and esoteric matters. Nice, but he was an occult or two, but he was great with a pen. Coming up in our number seven spot, we have the Popol Vuh. This is a text written in the mid 1500s, and its name directly translates to the Book of the People. It discusses the Mayan language of Kaish, and it talks about the creation of mankind and animals. The book talks about how apparently before the creators of the world formed the earth, there was only sky and sea. Makes sense. Then they created animals, then mud men, then wooden men, and then four men out of corn. Sounds like the author was on some kind of illicit substance. <laughs> Apparently women were made while the men were sleeping. Sounds like quite the weird tale that I could probably stand by saying that it's most likely cursed. The author sure seems like he was under some kind of spell to think up the idea of men being made of corn. Just. In our number six spot, we have the Cavern of Death. 
This is a very mysterious book, as it is actually one that was published anonymously. It is seemingly a fictional horror novel, but people believe it to possibly hold some weird dark magic within its pages, but that could also be because it was written around the time of 1794 and people were more religious back then. The story is about Sir Albert, who survives a journey through the Black Forest, only to find out that the love of his life is engaged to a wealthy old baron. In a quest to save his love, Sir Sir Albert finds himself in the Cavern of Death, which is full of horrors, skeletons, and ghosts. Could the reason behind the anonymity be because it is really a tale of a true story? I guess we may never know. In our number 5 spot we have the Codex Seraphinianus. The Codex Seraphinianus is a book written in a language that is not real. Yes, you heard me correctly. This book is written in a language that is not a real language. It's either a masterpiece of art or the devil's book, I'm undecided. Apparently the book is about a world that does not exist. It was made in the late 70s and was published in 1981. The book is over 300 pages long in a language that doesn't exist. And it is full of illustrations of plants, animals, food, games, buildings, maps, and much more. It is one thing to write a book in a fake language that is 50 pages. Okay, sure, that sounds like a fun art project. Maybe fun isn't the right word, but that sounds like a challenging art project. Let's give it that. But to write a book that's 300 pages in a language that you've made up, that to me screams that this author maybe knows real live fairies or is friends with some kind of alien species, because how in the world do you commit to writing that many pages in a fake language? In any case, no one has ever cracked the code and figured out what the heck the book is about. That leads me to think that it's either something wondrous like the language of real live fairies or something demon-esque. Regardless, I'm concluding that it's most likely cursed. In our number four spot, we have The Book of Lies and The Book of the Law by Aleister Crowley. I honestly couldn't decide which book to choose for this spot, and since they are both from the same author, I decided to group them together. The reason being is because the author is quite dark, and anything produced by him is most likely a product of his energy. But that might be controversial to say, as a lot of people from the occult community praise him and think he did a lot of great in the world. But others disagree. This is a man that was a self-proclaimed occultist and magician who was alive during the period of 1875 to 1947 and lived in England. He had a large following of people who wanted to learn magic and he was known for channeling spirits and doing group magical naked rituals. If you catch my drift. Please catch my drift. He was actually kicked out of Italy in 1923 after word got around about his gatherings. Understandable. He understood himself to be a prophet, with the task to help bring humanity into the next era. Sounds like a true narcissist to me. In any case, his books completely creep me out and so I had to add them to the list. In our number two spot we have Necronomicon. Okay, this book gives me the creeps straight away. It's so dark visually and right away you just know that it isn't a book about how to make your dreams come true. It's more about how to destroy others' dreams. <laughs> okay, I'm joking. but. Honestly, I think it's possibly worse than that. Known for being one of the most haunted books of all time, you just know that this book is cursed. Arguably, if anyone were ever given this book, then they might have someone wanting to curse them because its low vibes are just screaming off of its pages, and who would want that for anyone? Apparently, inside its pages are instructions to contact your deceased loved ones, and there are pretty frightening pictures on its pages. The original copy of the book is actually kept inside a locker within Massachusetts Miskatonic University. If that's not telling you everything, then I don't know what to tell you. And number 10, we have it. Yeah, we all know what this is about and you've seen the movies. But if you weren't spooked by the movies, then you should definitely read the book because it's way scarier. One of my buddies told me a story about how his dad was reading the book and getting so scared while he was reading the book that his mom made him stop reading it because he kept waking her up from night terrors. There are some points in the book that are so much more horrible. Like the bully in the book, Henry Bowers, is way, way worse in the book than he is in the movies. He is almost as evil as Pennywise himself. At one point he pins down Ben Haskam and he carves his name into his stomach like he's carving a turkey. He also whitewashes a kid's face in snow until he starts bleeding everywhere and he also hunts down a dog and kills it. 
This is all before he gets sent to jail and then escapes from jail and is even more dangerous than before. That alone is enough to make the book much more terrifying. And there's also a weird group sex scene who everyone who reads the book talks about because it's super strange. Starting us off at number 10 is The Exorcist. I would be doing an injustice if I didn't start with one of the scariest movies of all time. And why was it the scariest movie of all time? Because it was one of the scariest books of all time. Written by William Peter Blatty and published in 1971, the book takes place in Washington DC and follows demonically possessed 12 year old Reagan McNeil who is also the daughter of a very famous actress. The duo are in Georgetown whilst the mother is filming when Reagan becomes sick. Weird things start happening around the house which her mother tries to find rational explanations for and Reagan's condition intensifies and deteriorates. Nothing helps her until the mother gives in and turns to a priest for help. A pair of priests spend the whole book trying to exorcise the demon and it was actually based off of a real case of possession William heard about in the 50s. I don't want to go into more detail and include spoilers because if you haven't read it you definitely should. I feel like scary books just scare you in a way that movies just can't. When I used to read them at home alone I physically could not continue reading because I was scared. I was scared of reading. Like, that is a real fear, people. Coming in at number 9 is Blindness. Written by Jose Saramago and published in 1995, the book follows an unnamed city or country that's been afflicted with an unexplainable epidemic of blindness. And since most people there go blind, a social and economic breakdown soon follows. The plot involves a group of unnamed characters, and the book is written in really long sentences, and there are no speech marks around the dialogue, so you're also like, wait, who's speaking right now? The first half of the book takes place in a dirty overcrowded asylum where the group and countless other blind people have been quarantined. And the whole thing descends into anarchy basically. People are worried about the availability of food, necessities, no medicines are allowed inside so even a small infection could end up deadly. Gangs start forming, they start raping women in exchange for giving them food, it just gets really really bad. The only person in the land that doesn't get infected was the doctor's wife and we follow how she has to try and help the group survive. At number 8 we have The Haunting of Hill House. It's it's not a horror if a haunted house isn't on this list, am I right? Written by Shirley Jackson and published in 1959, the book has been dubbed one of the best literary ghost stories in the 20th century. It went on to become two films, a play, and the basis of a Netflix series, so it's safe to say even in the 21st century we are getting a lot of inspiration from it. Shirley even drew the floor plans of the house and its outside before beginning the novel. The plot takes place in a mansion called Hill House and follows four main characters. An investigator of the supernatural, Eleanor, a shy girl, and a disabled mother, Theodora, and the mansion's heir, Luke. They all come to the house because of having experienced something paranormal or wanting to investigate the paranormal. The house itself has been the site of many deaths and suicides, and as their state progresses, creepy things start happening, as they always do. The house itself seems sentient and angry, but the best part of the book is the narrator. We trust Eleanor from the start because she seems quite reliable and sweet, but as the book progresses she becomes more and more unreliable, she starts descending into madness, and then it gets confusing on whether the things happening in the house are really happening, or she's just seeing things or hallucinating them. I'm just gonna leave it at that. At number 7 we have Pet Cemetery. It should be no surprise that there is more than one Stephen King book on this list. He's one of the greatest horror writers that has ever walked the earth. We gotta give him a lot of love. Pet Cemetery is one of the great horror classics. You have a cat that dies and then gets buried in a supernatural cemetery. The cat comes back to life. Holy crap, that is amazing. But then the protagonist's daughter dies. They have a funeral for the poor girl, but he can't live with it. He refuses to have his daughter taken away from him. So he goes to the graveyard, digs up his daughter, and then buries her in the supernatural cemetery where it will bring her back to life. And it does. But now the sacred bond between life and death has been broken. I don't want to give away what happens next because it's a great book and you should definitely give it a read. At number three, we have Misery. This is a book that will make anyone second guess getting famous. The book follows an author who gets into a brutal car accident and then wakes up in a woman's home. She is a huge fan and is nursing him back to health. Well that's what it seems like until he learns that she is keeping him their prisoner. He tries to escape, he tries to drug her but continuously fails and then when she realizes that he's trying to leave her she cuts off his feet so he can't leave. Then he has to beat her to death with a typewriter so he can make it out a footless man. All because she was absolutely obsessed with him. 
Talk about abandonment issues. Starting us off with number 10 is the incest diary. I told you guys it can appear in any video, always be prepared for it. Published in 1999, the book goes into excruciating detail about a girl's incestuous relationship with her dad. The abuse began when she was 14 and lasted till her late 20s. Wow. The woman even tried going to the police to file charges against her dad, but the officer said it had been too long and that she should just write her story down. Justice, the police, it's nothing, he said. And so she did. She wrote a book. The book goes from flashbacks to her childhood to adulthood. It has her inner monologues that contradict themselves constantly. Her manic fixations are clear in the book, and she goes into detail about how it informed every single thing she ever did, how she sought the abuse and reenacted it in other relationships, how if anything she started craving the abuse. The book sold more than 70,000 copies in France in the first three months after its release. I mean it's dark, it's graphic, and it's anonymous. Coming in at number 9 is A Woman in Berlin. This one came out in English in 1954 and it's said to be memoirs of an anonymous German woman. It covers April to June 1945 when the Red Army occupied Berlin. The woman is a journalist and she goes on to describe really dark subject matter matter like getting gang raped by Russian soldiers and trying to survive in the situation by dating a Soviet officer and how other girls had to make similar decisions. Women literally had no protection from anyone at that time so it really was eat or be eaten. When it was first published in Germany it was met with a lot of disgust since it was just too soon to talk about the German suffering but two years after Hitler died the book was republished and was on the bestsellers list for more than 20 weeks. The author was actually revealed in 2003 posthumously by Jens Biskey, a literary editor. She identified the author to be Marta Hillers and Marta's publisher was absolutely livid at the invasion of privacy that had caused. I don't get why people can't just let other people remain anonymous. Like can everyone just live their lives and stop interfering in other people's lives? That'd be great. At number 8 we have Go Ask Alice. Now this book was published anonymously in 1971 and it revolves around the diary of a girl who gets addicted to drugs at 15 and then runs away from home. It's funny when I saw this book in a bookshop a few years ago I really wanted to read it but I had way too many unread books at the time on my shelf so I didn't get it but it's ironic it's popped up into my life once again. But anyway the book follows this girl as she goes through heartbreak, intense drug use, rape, body image, social acceptance etc. It's sort of a coming of age story if anything but laser focused on drugs. She basically moves city due to her dad's job and goes home one summer to stay with her grandparents. She attends a party, she tries a drink laced with LSD unknowingly and so begins the journey of drugs. If you're interested in the title of the book it's actually referencing a song called White Rabbit which is alluding to Alice in Wonderland. Alice eats and drinks a bunch of things that change her size so they're kind of linking that to a drug experience. But there is a twist and it's not the book's ending. Controversy sparked in the 70s because of Beatrice Sparks and people thinking she was the author of the book. She was initially credited as the editor but then records showed she was the sole author and then apparently it was the diary of a deceased teenager. I mean it's really all over the place but the book does look amazing but also scarily real. Now at number 6 is Carrion Comfort. Written by Dan Simmons and published in 1989 it won the Locust Poll Award for Best Horror Novel, the Bram Stoker Award and the August Derleth Award for Best Novel. Stephen King even calls it one of the greatest horror novels of the 20th century. So, based on that, I reckon it's a pretty good book. The book focuses on a fraction of humanity who has intense psychic powers called the ability. These people can control someone from a distance and I mean control them, like physically too as in they could make someone commit murder if they really wanted to. Killing someone indirectly gives the ability users energy and youth so they're almost like pseudo vampires. The book sets up the fact the abilities have been used throughout time, whether that's fake charisma of a world leader, everyday murders or the holocaust. Although it's split into many timelines, it mostly follows a group of immoral people in the 80s, some of which want to take over the world. Investigators pursue a series of murders and realize these people really need to be stopped. It's honestly brutal, they get together in one scene and talk about all the people they killed including John Lennon and then later on two of them end up fighting but use normal humans around them as soldiers to fight each other. It's screwed up 
but isn't every book on this list? Coming in at number 5 is A Head Full of Ghosts. Written by Paul G. Tremblay and published in 2015, the book follows an American family that's trouble. The dad is unemployed, they barely have any money, and then things get even worse due to the mental illness of their 14 year old daughter, Marjorie. The book is told from the perspective of Marjorie's 8 year old sister, Mary, and it starts when Marjorie starts telling Mary macabre stories instead of innocent Dr. Seuss ones. Welcome to the real world, Mary. Anyway, the dad, who is a born again Catholic, decides Marjorie doesn't have a mental illness, she's demonically possessed, two very different things, and so he gets the help of his priest to try and exorcise her. And let's just say Marjorie is not really telling the truth. I'll leave it at that. At number 4 is Let the Right One In. Written by John Lindquist and published in English in 2008, the book is essentially a vampire story but it's not like Twilight before you guys just skip number 4. And for the record, I just like to say I read all the Twilight books and the books were actually really really good. Please do not base the series on Kristen Stewart's acting, thank you. But anyway, the plot follows a 12 year old boy called Oscar, a vampire child called Eli and its caretaker Hakan. The story takes place in Stockholm in the 80s and focuses on a plethora of of disturbing things like pedophilia, self mutilation, murder, bullying, genital mutilation, etc. Oscar becomes friends with Eli when it moves in next door, and he finds out Eli was turned into a vampire when they were a child and hence forever remains in a young body and mind. Hakan, Eli's caretaker, was a former teacher who got caught with child pornography, and as you can imagine, he's very much in love with Eli and goes out and kills people and gets blood for them in order to sustain them in exchange for money. Even though Hakan would do it for free if Eli would let them be physically intimate, but we all know that's not gonna happen. The story goes on when Hakan gets caught on his last blood procuring mission and things just get worse and worse from there. Death, murder, acid throwing, blood drinking, the book has it all, and it was adapted into two feature films. And finally, at number one is Rosemary's Baby. Written by Era Levin and published in 1967, the book sold over 4 million copies and that made it the best selling horror novel of the 60s. The plot follows Rosemary Woodhouse and her struggling actor husband Guy, who recently move into an old gothic apartment building. Despite being warned about the building's strange history involving murder and witchcraft, they move in anyway. And the couple are quickly welcomed by neighbours Minnie and Roman, who Rosemary gets a weird vibe from. Due to some freak accident blinding his theatrical rival, Guy gets a great role and agrees to try for their first kid. Hurrah! but not. But that night, Rosemary has a sexual dream involving an inhuman creature, and the next day she has claw scratches all over her boobs, on her crotch, basically everywhere. And then somehow she becomes pregnant, but then falls severely ill, losing more and more weight and craving raw meat. Everything goes tits up, and I can 100% say Guy is not the father. Coming in at number 5 is Might is Right. And this one is definitely going to anger all our feminists out there, so here's to hoping this seems problematic to everyone watching, hopefully, fingers crossed. Published in 1890, this non-fiction book is a lot to take in. It focuses mostly on social Darwinism, which applies natural selection and the whole survival of the fittest science to human society and politics. He emphasizes how humans are motivated by our own selfish wants, and we base our decisions on the consequences of them rather than if they're morally right or not. He claims only physical strength can lead to moral right and actively bashes democracy and Christianity. He says BS like weakness should be viewed with hatred and that women and families are the property of men since they are more superior. It was even dubbed as proto-fascist white power manifesto, which I'm inclined to agree with. The author went by the pseudonym Ragnar Redbeard, so that's clearly not a real name, but interestingly enough, a white supremacist publisher and the Church of Satan founder both think Jack London wrote the book, and if he didn't, that's a really brutal accusation by some pretty questionable people. At number 4 is the autobiography of an ex-coloured man. What a title. The title itself literally had me. I was like, ex-coloured man? What does that even mean? Order on Amazon right now. But anyway, published in 1912, the book is a fictional account of a biracial man whose name we never find out since he's always just called the ex-coloured man. The story follows his life living in America at the end of the 19th century when things like lynchings were very much still happening. His dream is to glorify black people people through ragtime music, but after seeing the way society worked, he started passing as white to make his life easier and safer. He forms a friendship with a character called the Rich White Gentleman, and despite being a free man, there were aspects of slave master dynamics within this relationship.
relationship. It was originally published anonymously since the author was a diplomat and wasn't sure how controversial the book could be since issues of race and discrimination weren't really discussed in books back then. When it was republished 15 years later and it did moderately well, the author decided to be credited and so the book's anonymity died in 1927. James Weldon Johnson is the man of the hour. And if you don't know what that means, that just means he's the author. <laughs> now at number 2 is Frankenstein. I know, I know, Mary Shelley, we know she wrote it, don't come for me. She started writing it at 18 and published it at 20. Can you imagine publishing one of the most renowned pieces of gothic fiction at the age of 20? What were we doing at 20? Freaking twiddling our thumbs and playing Temple Run on our iPads probably. Oh, that's what I was doing at 20. <laughs> Actually, no it wasn't. Cut that out, editor. When it was originally published in 1818, it was done so anonymously for many reasons probably. I mean she was 20 for one, who's gonna take a 20 year old seriously? Her dad was a very famous author so maybe it was also the pressure of living up to that that she didn't want, or maybe if it didn't do well she just didn't want anything to do with it. Many actually thought her husband Percy wrote it since he's the one who wrote the introduction for it. When its second edition was published in 1823, that's actually when she appeared as the author. The the novel was met with great success which let the family move to Italy and get lit really. Actually no it wasn't lit, her life was very tragic, but yeah here's to Mary Shelley. Coming in at number 10 we have Real Life Death Notes. Death Note is a Japanese manga series written by Toshimi Oba. I'm really sorry if I pronounced that wrong. This story is about a high school student who comes across a mysterious notebook, the Death Note. He soon finds out that he can use the notebook to kill people by simply writing their names down. This series was adapted into an American movie and it is now on Netflix. Anyway, a lot of teenagers in real life have been inspired by the manga series and the film and they've started their own Death Notebooks. There have been countless incidents, for example in Pingtung County in Taiwan one, they saw a string of Death Note inspired issues. In 2015, a middle school student in Pennsylvania was suspended for making his own Death Notebook and writing the names of 15 students in it. Some people say that the story of Death Note stems back to some truth too, with legends circulating that in ancient Chinese civilizations, the Yellow Emperor had a notebook of death. I actually have to thank one of our subscribers for bringing this next book to my attention. I was reading the comments on the Top 10 Cursed Books Part 1, and one one of our subscribers highlighted this to me, so thank you Kim Jana for the recommendation. Coming into number 9, we have the Book of the Son of Genus. This is a 13th century grimoire containing Arabic magic spells and provides guidance for the afterlife. The book is all about demons and jinns and evil beings, and despite being a highly influential text in the Arabic and Muslim worlds, it has long been banned in a lot of Islamic cultures for its subject matter. The book allows the reader to communicate with spirits, but that does doesn't always mean good spirits. Coming into number 8, we have the cursed Babylonian tablets. Babylon was said to be an ancient city in what is present day Iraq and Syria. The Babylonian era ran from 1895 BCE to around 7 BCE, so hundreds of years. Back in those days, books weren't really a thing, instead people read from inscriptions on tablets, so rocks or stone. These tablets were often known to carry a curse. A Babylonian king placed a curse on a set of clay tablets back in the 7th century BCE, having the text inscribed with, whosoever shall carry off this tablet, or shall inscribe his name on it side by side with mine own, may Asher and Belit overthrow him in wrath and anger, and may they destroy his name and the prosperity in the land. A bit dramatic. It turns out that actually these tablet curses were very common. Because reading material was hard to find, ancient people often tried safeguarding their property by claiming it was cursed. Basically it was a ye olde way of making sure little twerps didn't steal your things. Alright, this book seems to be a favourite amongst murderers at number 10, we have The Catcher in the Rye, which you shouldn't read unless you want to go mad. Oddly, The Catcher in the Rye seemed to inspire two very high profile shootings, the murder of John Lennon and the attempted murder of Ronald Reagan. John Lennon was shot dead on the 8th of December 1980 by Mark David Chapman. The lone gunman from Texas was found to be obsessed with JD Salinger's novel and was found calmly reading it on a curb nearby his attack on Lennon prior to his arrest. It seems he wrote his statement in 
inside the novel too. He felt like if he carried out the assassination, he would become Holden Caulfield, the protagonist of the novel. Five months later, on March the 30th, 1981, John Hinckley carried out an assassination attempt on the 40th President of the United States, Ronald Reagan. It seems that Hinckley's motivation was a weird attempt to win over actress Jodie Foster, whom he had an obsession with. When Hinckley was caught, he was found with a copy of none other than The Catcher in the Rye. Coming in at number 9, we have The Orphan Story. This story was written by a Malaga monk between 1608 and 1615. Now it's about an orphan from Granada who travelled to the Spanish Empire to seek his fortune. For some reason, the transcript never made it to print, and everyone that seemed to be associated with it died. The manuscript was lost for centuries, some say hidden away because of the curse. Then a string of publishing attempts failed, and people just started dying. The book, however, is to be finally published. Belinda Palacios, a Peruvian editor, said that she was regularly warned off the project because of the string of untimely deaths associated with the book. She said it's taken a while because the people who have worked on it died from one strange disease or in car accidents. I think that this is one book that I would steer clear of. Okay, this book may kill you, but not because of demons or devils, but because of cancer. Wait, a book that gives you cancer? Awful. That's right, coming in at number 8, we have Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. When Bradbury's 1953 book about a dystopian future came out, the marketing team had a wise idea. The book is about a group of so called firemen who burn down the homes and belongings of people who read illegal, non state approved books. Wouldn't it be cool for the limited edition books to be fireproof? It sure would. The only issue was that people didn't know what was what in the 1950s and the book was bound with asbestos. You know, the substance that gives you lung cancer. Not great. So while the book in itself is a bit of a scary read, the reality of the book is even scarier. Coming into number 7, we have The Babadook Book. There was a time when the book from the 2014 Australian horror movie The Babadook was fiction. The book in the movie is cursed and or haunted, as it is constantly delivered to Amelia and Oscar's home. In the movie, the book depicts the horrifying events that are about to befall the family in a creepy pop-up style. Now, movie lovers have gone one step further and demanded that the illustrator turn the fictional book into a reality. That's right, you can now buy the haunted book for yourself in real life. Following a successful crowdfunding campaign, Insight Editions was chosen to create a limited run of 6,000 books. I think it's a really cool idea, but I'm not sure if I'd want that in my home. If it's in a word or it's in a look, you can't get rid of the Babadook. Duck, duck, so get that book out of my house, thanks. Coming in at number six, we have A Portrait of Marriage by Curiosity Incorporated. I was trying to do some research into lesser known haunted books because I guess only the bigger stuff makes headlines, and I thought, you know what? There must be like, you know, your average bog standard ghost that has chosen to haunt your average bog standard book, and it turns out I was right. I found a video by small and up and coming YouTuber Curiosity Incorporated, and he's an antique. Trader. He made a video called Saga of the Haunted Book, who knew books could be so creepy. In this video, he talks about how he bought a bunch of old books off a dealer, and as she left, she basically just turned around and said to him, Oh, by the way, one of these is haunted. I'm not sure how I would deal with that. Like, tell me it's haunted before I buy it. The book is called Portrait of a Marriage by Vita Sackville West and Harold Nicholson. It seems that the spirit had an attraction to the book. Now, the antiques dealer said, I certainly wouldn't want to be the guy who got stuck haunting this book. So far though, he hasn't mentioned any further weird goings on. Forget about one spooky book, all of the books in this library are plagued by a pesky spirit. Coming into number 5, we have the Leeds Library Ghost. Leeds, Yorkshire, England, one of my favourite places. Yorkshire is steeped in ancient history, so you'll regularly hear ghost stories coming from this area of the United Kingdom. The Leeds Library dates back to 1768, so it's older than the USA. The ghost haunting the premises is said to be the first ever librarian of the building, Vincent Sternberg. In 1844, the new librarian, James McAllister, came face to face with the ghost of Sternberg as he worked late at night. Now, the ghost is said to linger most frequently around the old books, and in 2012, researcher Jeremy Dyson spent 12 hours in the library documenting the hauntings. He uploaded a really interesting and revealing video to YouTube that actually captures some of the ghostly goings on in the building. 
moving. Another investigator, Sean Reynolds, captured a ladder moving alongside a bookshelf at the library. Coming in at number four, we have the Necromicon pop-up nightmare book featuring Cthulhu. Anyone who loves the Evil Dead franchise will know about the fictional Book of the Dead. This Book of the Dead has actually long since been mentioned in literature, possibly first in the 1924 H.P. Lovecraft's The Hound. Either way, Proposition Press have taken it upon themselves to turn the Necromicon into a truly terrifying pop-up book. The book has five pop-up scenes, including pull tabs, and they depict moments from the five original Evil Dead stories. The Dunwich Horror, The Shadow Out of Time, The Call of the Cthulhu, At the Mountain of Madness, and The Color Out of Space. Now, they may not actually be cursed like the source material, but I have to say the images will haunt my nightmares forever. Muggles beware at number three, this grimoire will get you. In 2013, two handwritten spiral bound spell books or grimoires were sold for $13,865 in Toronto via abebooks.com. A grimoire is a witch's spell book and is generally believed that actually the book has to be burned after the death of the witch or else the book becomes cursed. Now these grimoires appear to have been written in the 1960s by a high priestess of Wicca called Adele. Estra Irene. She was said to be an American witch with English and Swedish ancestry. Now it's not known what's happened to her, whether she's alive or dead, but the opening pages of both of the texts contained a warning that reads, to those not of the craft, the reading of this book is forbidden. Proceed no further or justice will exact a swift and terrible retribution, and you will surely suffer at the hand of the craft. So basically, no muggles allowed. Next up, this depressing book led to a spate of suicides. At number two, we have The Sorrows of Young Werther. The Sorrows of Young Werther is a best-selling book written by a 25-year-old Wolfgang von Goeth. The book was published in Germany in 1774 and is a semi-autobiographical tale of a failed romance. It's told via letters from a man named Werther to his friend Wilhelm. When Werther finds out that his love has married another man, he borrows two pistols and shoots himself, although he botches it and it takes him a grueling 12 hours to die. The book led to some of the first known examples of copycat suicides. The men would dress in the same clothing as described by Goeth and use a pistol to shoot themselves. Often the book was found at the scene of suicides. Now after the book's publication and the spate of copycat suicides, sociologists began to suspect that suicide may be culturally contagious. Finally, at number one, this is one of the most interesting things I learned today. So next up, this one author cursed himself and everyone involved in his book's publication, and he's now the target of a serious Iranian murder plot. What am I talking about? Salaman Rushdie and the Curse of the Satanic Verses. Salaman Rushdie received a very, very, very intense response from the Muslim community for his fourth novel, The Satanic Verses. The book, in fact, garnered such an intense response that a fatwa was ordered. For those of you that don't know what that is, it's basically a death order and the current monetary value of it is thought to be over three million dollars. This was issued by Atola Rola Khomeini, the former supreme leader of Iran. Now Rushdie became the target of the Muslim order and it's still in place. It wasn't just him either. The Iranian government demanded the death of the author and all of those involved in its publication. While Rushdie wasn't hit, his Japanese translator was stabbed to death in 1991. The Italian translator was also stabbed in July 91, but he survived. The Norwegian publisher, William Nygaard, was shot three times in 1993, but survived. And it's thought that the fatwa was behind a deadly fire at a hotel in Turkey in which 35 people died. Salaman Rushdie is still alive, but he is still under police protection some Muslims out there still want to kill him. It turns out that fatwas can only be retracted by the person that issued them and Khomeini is dead. Mm -hmm.